don't know. Where they are. Okay, we are live. I'll wait for a couple people to come in here. The VQ opens in a month. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the usually good sign of spring. Yeah. First sign of spring, Dairy Queen. <laughs> Thank you. This <laughs> opens around yeah. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Uh, I went to uh, someone's house. We had a, we just did a game night one night with uh-huh. a bunch of us from Boulder. Oh, yeah. And I stopped at, they were open. I yeah. stopped and bought a bunch of Billy bars. And yeah. halfway through, we're all sitting around this great big table. Yeah. And it was time for a Billy bar break. Of course. I had taken a picture of it. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of Rick Russo, Jan Tobush. Oh, good evening. What's that? Caroline is sick? Oh, with COVID or something else? Not COVID, but she's got the other thing like Chris. Oh. So, so I don't know. So, the health care issue is this little person. Sue on McAbane. Oh, that's who's house. Who else is there? And I think we're going to skip Fridays for now. Skip Fridays. Oh, the senior Friday, senior me. When they finally come out of out of Catholic school, they don't have to come out. But they were there. Who did the gal marry? Who did she marry? Uh, Sue McAbee. All right, Sarah says she is happy to be here tonight. She's our so far our lone online watcher. Yeah, so far I only sh- it shows only shows one online. So not even Donna. Uh, Donna is just getting off work, so I don't know what she's. She usually watches later. Yeah, right. <laughs> I somehow don't think that would fly real well. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so today we are beginning the Book of the Twelve. And uh, so we're going to talk about uh, that, and uh, we'll, we'll begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for gathering us together around your word, and we ask you, Lord, to be present among us as we study the prophets of the Old Testament. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless us with uh, insights uh, into you and into your will uh, through these prophets who wrote so long ago and said so many things that are so applicable for our life today. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's see. Sarah says, okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> she likes it when she gets the shout out. <laughs> Of course, you. Yeah. Oh, she, you need to watch, uh, listen to the sermon on Sunday because you're getting a shout out on Sunday too. So, or, or chemists in general are getting a shout out, but you particular. Yeah, that's uh, we're talking about water into wine, and how that would drive chemists crazy. Yeah. Uh, huh? Where does it say Donnie's watching? Oh, really? And now it says, yeah, it says there's two viewers, but it doesn't tell me who. Isn't that interesting? How come it doesn't, the presenter didn't, didn't, oh, well. Uh, What's that? Oh, Facebook did? Oh, I didn't know that. It still says Facebook on here, yeah. All right, so the Book of the Twelve. Uh, often you'll hear them called the Minor Prophets. Uh, in fact, that's I grew up always hearing them called the Minor Prophets. Uh, but the uh, Septuagint, which is the, the Latin translation of the Hebrew Bible, called it the Book of the Twelve. Uh, and, and so that's kind of fallen into more popular usage. Uh, because major and minor, the major prophets were Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and the minor prophets were all the others. 
And ma the words major and minor sort of lead you to think in terms of, uh, of uh, quality. Like, and I, that's what I always thought, too. You know, these are the important guys, Isaiah, Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, and uh, Jeremiah. And, and these, Hosea, Joel, Amos, these guys are not so important. You don't really need to read those. And so, you know, I, for years, and in, even into my ministry, I hadn't really read the minor prophets I mean, any more than I had to to pass tests, you know. Not, I didn't really ever study them, you know, uh, carefully. Um, and so that's why they stopped saying uh, largely major and minor, and now they talk about the Book of the Twelve. So what they, when they say minor prophet, what they're talking about is quantity, not quality. The Twelve Prophets... In the book of the 12, all of their writings could fit on a scroll about the same size as one of the other prophets. So you had Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, whom I missed, and Ezekiel, and then you had the book of the 12. As it was a fifth scroll uh, that, that uh, occupied about the same amount of, of space. That's, that's the only reason they came to be known as the minor prophets. Um, so it's, it's helpful to know how the Old Testament, because a lot of times uh, people have not studied the Old Testament at all. I don't know how it was when you grew up, but when I grew up uh, in church, we had an epistle reading and a gospel reading. My whole life until I got into college, I never even heard the Old Testament read in church. Uh, because if you remember the red hymnal, yeah. it calls for an epistle reading and a gospel reading, and the Old Testament is optional. Yeah, it's an optional reading. Uh, where when they went to the Blue Hymnal, Lutheran Worship, in 1982, and, and LBW, Lutheran Book of Worship, was the, uh, was the um, American Lutheran Church's version of that in 1978, they all put the Old Testament in as a proper, that you would have the Old Testament every Sunday, because the recognition was people just were completely ignorant of the Old Testament. Uh, also, you know, preachers never preached on the Old Testament. When I grew up, I don't, I don't ever remember hearing my pastor preach on the Old Testament. He preached almost exclusively on the Gospels. Uh, occasionally, he'd preach on one of the epistles. Uh, but, but they were um, the 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 guy. The way the guys were trained in the 30s and 40s and 50s was that you preach on the Gospels. That was the main thing because the, the idea was you don't preach on the Old Testament because that doesn't apply anymore. That's old. You don't preach in the epistles because those are already sermons based on the Gospels, okay? Based on what they experienced. I mean, obviously it wasn't written down yet for most of them, but, but, but based on what their, their experience in the Gospels. So that's what, so you always preach on the Gospels. In reality, all of the epistles are, are really sermons on the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the text. That's the only text that was really written down uh, or, and, and known were the, were the Old Testament texts. Uh, and the gospel, if you think about that, what text, when, whenever Jesus was preaching and teaching, what text was he using? Well, yeah, I mean, it had to be Old Testament, right? Yeah. I mean, it would make sense that they, that they would teach on the Old Testament because that's what everybody knew. Yeah. Right. And that's what was bringing us over to the new. You know? Right. That's all there was. And so Jesus himself preaches on, uh, on the Old Testament. Oh, I lost a viewer. I either lost Danya or I lost Sarah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's so frustrating when we would read things and it would have references, but there was no way to reference. Right, you'd get Bibles with just the New Testament and Psalms. No Psalms, just the New Testament. Oh, really? Now, see, I had, when I was growing up, I had a, we had a Bible that was the New Testament and Psalms. And I think I was in middle school before I knew there was, there was an Old Testament. <laughs> I don't think I ever yeah. Yeah, the minor prophets. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's common in Lutheranism, uh, because the, the preachers up up until the pastors who were coming out in the eighties, uh, really maybe late seventies, uh, the the focus was all on the Gospels. Even Bishop, if you remember Bishop? Yeah. He, Bishop. Yeah. yeah. He never preached on anything but the Gospels. Yeah, I know. No, he didn't like the Old No. He used to tell me. Yeah, or teach it. No, he would tell me uh, he, when I when I uh, when I would give get him about that. He would tell me 
Uh, my uh, my Hebrew is not good enough anymore to, to <laughs> preach on. <laughs> so yeah, you know it's it's um, it, it and it does require. I mean, the Hebrew is rough. So you know you have to use the the, the tools. Yeah, most of us, most pastors, are not good enough at the Hebrew to just wing it and, and grab a, the Hebrew Bible and start. You know, we have to use our tools, and but uh, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. You know, and and when I preach on Old Testament texts, a lot of times I don't translate the whole text. I might translate just a, a piece of what I'm really focusing on, uh, because it does. It is. It's difficult. It's weighty to translate when you don't use it every day. When you're not a when you're not a linguist. Um, okay, so the Old Testament, how's it, how's it broken up? The first part of the Old Testament is the Pentateuch, uh, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it's called Pentateuch because it's a handy word that means five books. <laughs> Tuk is book, five, Penta is five, five books. Uh, it's the five books of Moses. Uh, and, and Moses wrote, as far as we know, all of it except for the last part of Deuteronomy that he couldn't very well write because he was dead. Uh, <laughs> So somebody finished off Deuteronomy for him. Uh, and uh, as far as we know, he wrote all of that. Uh, the former prophets uh, are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Okay, Those are the former prophets, the prophets before uh, Isaiah and, and uh, Jeremiah. So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. The latter prophets, sometimes called the major prophets, are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Okay, Those are the latter prophets. The 12 are Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then the last part, last division is the writings. The writings are Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Okay. Um, now, I think that this, that particular uh, division puts Daniel in the writings. Some people put Daniel in the latter prophets, but it, it, you go both ways. You'll see it both ways. Um, so we're going to look at the Book of the Twelve in uh, non-chronological order. Okay? I mean, I mean I'm sorry, non-biblical order. Chron we're going to look at it in chronological order, not biblical order. Uh, because I think it just makes a little bit more sense as we read through it as, and the touch on the history. The tricky one, uh, or one of the, they're all a little tricky, but Obadiah is our first one or our last one. We're not sure which. So we're going to do Obadiah first. But some people put Obadiah as last. Uh, and, I'll, and, and we'll talk about that more as we, when we get into it. Uh, one dating system says Obadiah wrote around 845 B.C., Okay, uh, then Joel, uh, around 835, that would have been during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. Okay, uh, then Jonah, around 782. Oh, we're not, you don't have to find them right now. I'm just going over the 12, and then we're going to go back to Obadiah. So Obadiah, 845, Joel, 835, Jonah, 782, Hosea, 760, Amos was a contemporary of Hosea. They both wrote about the same time, 760. Uh, then Isaiah. So see, Isaiah doesn't come in until 739. So the first major prophet, uh, or, or uh, uh, latter prophet, whatever you want to call him, uh, is Isaiah. Then we go to Micah, who was a contemporary of Isaiah. He wrote in 737. Nahum, who was also a contemporary of Isaiah, wrote in 650. Zephaniah, also contemporary, uh, no, not quite. He wrote in 640. Um, Jeremiah, uh, who's a, who comes in at 627. Habakkuk comes in at 609. Daniel now shows up at 605. Ezekiel follows Daniel at 593. Uh, Haggai follows Ezekiel at 520. Zechariah at 520, a contemporary of Haggai, and then the last one is Malachi at 433, and then so you have about 400 years until Jesus is born of the intertestamental period. Now, not all of those dates, that's why I don't make a big deal of it. They're all, all of them are contested. Uh, some people say one thing, some people say another. 
they're all approximate. Um, oh, Danya says she's here, so I don't know who who why I only have one viewer listed. I don't know. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, you mentioned what it, uh, Isaiah uh -huh. was in there. Uh, were the other major prophets within that group also, or were they before or after? Isaiah seven thirty nine. Jeremiah is the next major prophet. He comes in at 627. So he's about 100 years later uh, after Isaiah. Uh, then Daniel comes in at 605. So he's a contemporary uh, with, uh, with Jeremiah. And Ezekiel comes in at 593. Also sort of is, is a little bit later, but is, is in that range. So uh, uh, if these dates are correct, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel are all in the same range ballpark uh, and Isaiah's earlier. Yeah, if those dates are right. Um, and that's that, what I just gave you is, is the most traditional view. Uh, like I said, there's different views in different datings and things like that. When we get into Obadiah, we'll talk about why some people date it differently. Uh, in fact, let's just do that. Um, so like I said, Obadiah is either the first or the last. And the reason is the whole book is a prophecy against Edom. Okay, who's Edom? Yeah, who are they? Anybody remember the Edomites? Let's look at Genesis 25. Genesis 25, 19 to 34. Yeah, 19 through 24. Genesis 25, verses 19 through 24. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padaram, the sister of Laban, the Armenian, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body uh, like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand holding Esau's heel. So the name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Uh, when the boy grew up, and then there's, the story goes on, what happens? Remember what, it, what Esau does? Right. So Jacob dresses up in a hairy goat skin, gets his father to give him the blessing, uh, and, and he gets the birthright. And so it goes on from there. Now Esau then becomes the father of the Edomites. Yeah. So that's that's how... That's where the Edomites are from. So the Edomites and the Israelites are at each other's throats from then on out. Uh, there's, no, there's never a, a, any peace. So during King Jehoram's reign, uh, when Jerusalem was, was invaded by Philistines and Arabs, if you want to read about that, it's in 2 Kings 8 or uh, 2 Chronicles 21. It tells the, the story of the, the uh, Philistines and the Arabs invading and the Edomites didn't help. You know, they just stood back and, and let the uh, Philistines uh, and the Arabs uh, take, go into, into Israel. If Obadiah is the early writing, it's that. Okay, it's that. If Obadiah is the later writing, then it's talking about when the um, uh, Babylonians uh, come in and attack Jerusalem. 
Uh, and also, again, Edom didn't help. And in fact, uh, there's, there's some uh, texts that tell us that it, they laughed as uh, Israel was destroyed by, by Babylon and Jerusalem fell. Uh, so that's why it could be also be the late writing, that, that, that Obadiah was the last of the minor prophets as opposed to the first. It could be either way, but the point is, uh, is it's, it's still the same story. Okay, it's still the same issue. And Obadiah is so overlooked by the church because, you know, it's sort of, well, it's, a, it's the shortest book in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, once you've read, uh, once you've read, uh, you know, through the Psalms, you're not impressed by a, by a 21 verse book. Uh, you know, I, if you've done Psalm 119, you've done it all, you know. So, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just very ignored, but it's really, if you if you read it through Christian eyeglasses, it's really a cool promise for the church, okay? Because the church is the people of God. Uh, and sometimes we forget that, that we are the descendants of these people. Uh, sometimes we get confused because we accidentally call the people of the Old Testament Jews, and we think of them as part of the Jewish religion. No. That, no, these are these are the ancestors of Christianity. Okay, these are these are our people. Jews didn't come in until later on, and that beca that was a sect that was created out of God's people, um, that had power for a while. And so, you know, the the powerful are the ones who write the histories. Uh, and that's that's why it seemed like all of everybody in the Old Testament was Jews. Now, it's it is accurate to say that there were no Jews in the Old Testament. Uh, because Judaism really didn't come into being until intertestamental times after after the prophet Malachi wrote 433. Uh, you got to read um, uh, Maccabees in the in the um, apocrypha <clears throat> if you really want to see the beginning of Judaism. Uh, as we read Obadiah, and we're going to read through it here in just a minute, I want you to keep asking yourself, how does this apply to us in the modern world? Okay, can, can we see any of this in the modern world? Uh, people of our day clamor for religion to be relevant, right? Uh, do you hear that? Yes. Yeah, that religion needs to be relevant. But they don't listen. It's, it, what God says to us is super relevant. But if you're not listening, uh, you know, it's, it reminds me uh, of people who tell me, uh, you are not listening to me. And I always have to say, no, 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 I, I hear you. I'm not agreeing with you. There's a difference between not agreeing and not listening. Often God doesn't agree with us. It doesn't mean he doesn't listen to us. And we, can, we, we, can, uh, we have to listen to God if we ever want to get to agreement. Uh, it's amazing to me the number of people who will hear a, a, a straight scripture and say, well, I don't agree with that. How can you disagree with the creator of the universe? I don't understand that. I it just uh, Danya knows it sets me off. You know, I go berserk when I hear that. Well, I don't agree with that. It's what God says. How dare you disagree with God? You know, you can say I don't live up to that. I don't. That's hard to deal with. Um, I don't like that. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of stuff he says I don't like. Uh, you know. Forgive others as I forgive you. I don't like that a bit. I think I ought to be able to hold a grudge as long as I want to. You know? It's a dumb idea. If I were creator, I would have done it differently. But you can't disagree with it. It is what he says. That's, I, I ask that many times of people. I say, can we agree on what the word says? Do we agree that this is what the word says? And I like, if I can get people to that point, I'm happy. You know? Because if, if they say, okay, yeah, I agree with you. That is what the word says. Okay, good. Now we're on the same that we're on the same playing field. You're just not agree. You're, you're, you're disagreeing with God. Your business, you know. I don't want to be in your shoes, but you know, watch out for lightning bolts. I'm going to go stand over here behind this bush. Uh, but you go ahead and disagree with God. Uh, so the Bible is relevant to every single person, as it is. It is 100% relevant. What did Jesus say about ears many times in his ministry? Those who have ears hear, yeah. 
Yeah. His point was, if you don't want to know, if you don't want to hear this, you're not going to hear this. You know, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. Now pay attention. Put your put your preconceptions away, and listen to what I say. Uh, the, I'm looking forward to preaching the sermon coming up Sunday. Uh, it's it's you know, every now and then. You know, preachers have favorite sermons too. You know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we write stuff that we say, this is going to be really fun. Yeah, I like this one. And sometimes we write stuff that says, ugh, okay, I got to get it out. I mean, it's, it's time to preach. So, uh, but this one I'm really looking forward to because it's a, it's a twist on Jesus turning water into wine. Uh, and, we're, and the whole point of the sermon is looking at what Mary says. What does Mary say to the servants? Do what he tells you. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we skip over those words, or I do anyway, all the time, and I've never really thought through them. That what amazing faith! Do what he tells you. I don't know. I I mean, I don't know if Jesus had changed, you know, uh, things before that she had seen him do growing up. Uh, did you know? Did did Jesus uh, change liver into peanut butter? You know, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, Mary, Mary put, put down a nice dinner of liver and onions and turns around, turns her back and looks back and Jesus got steak and potatoes. Uh, Jesus, stop that. Hold on. Let's see if there's a... Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Di Sarah says, uh, uh, similar to those who say, not my president, saying something like, not my creator, just because it doesn't align with how they think and therefore is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, similar. Yeah. It's a fourth, can be a fourth commandment issue of obeying those in authority. Uh, so yeah, so I don't know if Jesus had changed stuff before, uh, but but we're not told about it. If he did, this is the first. The, the water into wine is the first miracle recorded. Uh, you wonder, you know, what Mary had seen because <laughs> I don't think God has to practice. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't think God ever has. A, there's never a point where he says, "Oh, I messed that one up." Uh, Except maybe the platypus. Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, so, so Mary seems to, maybe Mary had seen something to where she said when 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 they had a problem, she went, "Okay, look." She went to him, and you know, he gave, he told her, he says, "Woman, why are you telling me this?" Uh, which is not him being mean. That's I mean, woman is a term of endearment, like mom. You know, it would be a way a, 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 an Aramaic way of saying mom. Uh, and he says, uh, he's like, this is not, I'm not here to, to do magic tricks, you know. Uh, and he wants it to be clear to her that, you know, this is not his role on earth to uh, make every family member comfortable by providing them whatever they need and, you know, whatever. Uh, but, in, you know, so many times in Jesus's ministry, we see people who are rebuffed come back at him again and get what they want. Uh, get what they need anyway. Uh, and so it's interesting from that perspective too. I'm not going to go that way with the sermon, but you could. Is that, you know, is it like the Syrophoenician woman who, who said, uh, help me, Lord. And he says, I'm not here to give scraps to the dogs. You know, and she says, hey, even the dogs eat what falls off the master's table. And, and he helps her. You know, he does what, over and over and over again. We see that with Jesus. People, people, he rebuffs people and they come right back at him and he, and he says, your faith is has saved you. So Mary says to the servants, do what he tells you. She had absolute faith that he would take care of whatever needed to be taken care of. And he did. He changed water into wine. You know, and not just a little bit, uh, six, I think it was six great big containers. And not just better wine, but the best wine. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's why John highlights the miracle. Is that he wants us to understand that Jesus has the power with his words to change ordinary water into the best wine this wine steward had ever tasted. Okay. I, I think that's the power of God's word is I think what's highlighted in that miracle that we, um, uh, you know, we struggle in, as we as a people, the people of God, uh, struggle with to, to grasp. Um, it's, on, it, it's a faith issue. And people, you know, there's all levels of faith. Faith is a continuum. Um, and there's strong faith and weak faith. And at some point on that continuum, and I'm not sure where it is, but at some point you begin to believe that the word has absolute power. 
And when you begin to believe that, you begin to see it. It, 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 it's what I've experienced, is that you begin to see God's word have power in people's lives. Uh, and before that, you tend not to. You tend to, uh, you have a tendency to be, boy, I, that, you're, you were sure lucky. <laughs> you say things like that. Yeah. Um, and, and then you realize as you get, as your faith grows and your involvement with the word grows, you begin to see you know, God at work through his powerful word in all kinds of ways. And so Mary says, do what he tells you, and he does. Uh, so that's that's where I'm going with that. I'm not sure how I got off on that. Um, oh, relevance of the Bible. Yeah. That's, yeah. Do you think that, I don't know, don't think it's, that she, she didn't know that Jesus was going to take the water of the wine, but that he was going to do something different, or that he would do, he would take care of the situation? Yeah. I, I think she knew he would fix it. She came to him. She said, they've run out of wine, okay. which is a big deal. I mean, yeah, it's not a yeah, small thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's yeah, that's a small thing. Not a small thing because it was embarrassment to the family, embarrassment to the couple, a real downer for the whole party. You know, that was that was a big deal. And, 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 and you know, especially in that culture, mm -hmm. it was horrible. You know, they've run out of wine. And she doesn't know what to do about that. Right. She just knows Jesus can handle it. Yeah. They didn't have a liquor store. They couldn't run down to the liquor yeah. store and pick up yeah. some more. Yeah. You know, um, so I don't know how you got wine. You had to go to a, a vine dresser, I guess, and somebody made wine. Yeah. But I thought, her, I thought even at the cross, she wasn't exactly sure until at the cross. She well, yeah, I mean, you know, the question is, is that uh, the question is always if, if she had complete faith, uh, why was she going to dress his body at the tomb? You know, why, why wasn't she sitting outside the tomb, you know, with her, uh, uh, I don't know, iPad doing Sudoku puzzles or something and waiting for like what time is he going to arise he said he'd be up you know um you know she went to address his body yeah. so the, the yeah the question is is did she have faith i think even the greatest faith would be really tested in watching your son crucified oh, yeah. and seeing his dead body taken down off the, the you know mm -hmm. and i mean there she heard the prophecy mm -hmm. that i will rise in three days and surely there must have been some hope but I don't know. I don't know how much. Well, sure, everybody's is. I think. Yeah, I think everybody everybody's is. Uh, yeah, no. When I say dressing the body, um, what I mean is um, they uh, uh, had spices uh, for uh, they they didn't have embalming, but they had they wrapped the body in spices and things like that that kept it from. Uh, well, from stinking, for one thing, uh, and uh, helped in the preservation, I guess. I, I'm not sure exactly. You'd have to look into that more to find exactly what the spices did, but that was the, that's what they were doing. It's, cause it, it's because he had to be put into the tomb quickly uh, on Friday because the sundown was coming, and you can't be touching a dead body on the Sabbath. So he had to be stuck in the tomb quick, and then after the Sabbath, first thing Sunday morning, uh, they were, went back to the tomb, and of course they couldn't go on Saturday night because it was dark, and you know you don't want to do this by torchlight. And so, first thing sunrise Sunday morning, they went to the tomb to to take care of the putting the ointments and spices and whatever on the body, uh, so that that's how what they did. Yeah, it was a sign of respect. Yeah, in some senses, yeah, respect for the body, I guess. Yeah. It was nice of him to die before sundown. Yeah, right. Well, and no, and, and it was, and that's interesting because, uh, you know, that's, they went, the prophecy was that he had to be unblemished, right? No bone could be broken. Well, if you didn't die by sundown on the Sabbath, the Roman soldiers came through and broke your legs. They took a, a, a big board and they broke your legs so you couldn't push up anymore to breathe and you'd suffocate. Yeah. And so when they came to break his legs, 
he was already dead. Okay. And, they were, and, and they stuck a, a, a spear in his side to make sure he was dead. And that's when the, the water came flowing out of his side, you know. Um, but yeah, that's interesting because that was fulfilling prophecy that his no bone could be broken, uh, which they didn't really realize that they were fulfilling prophecy, which is interesting because uh, it's, that's a, again, a sign of how God uses heathens to accomplish his will. Because, you know, if they'd really, if they, if they thought it through, they should have broken his legs to screw up the prophecy, you know, but they couldn't because God was in control. See, I think mean, that's the thing. God was in control. It's not that they didn't want to or might not have thought about it. They couldn't. So I don't know. I don't know what went through their heads. I don't know what stopped them, but God did. And that's always important to remember uh, when when leaders and rulers in this world uh, posture themselves to be in charge. Uh, because you're not in charge. Nobody's in charge. God's in charge. We're all servants. You know, we have times of leadership that uh, God puts us in. That's why we pray for President Biden every Sunday, that God would give him the strength and the wisdom he needs to bear the office he has. Okay. He's been put there, but, uh, but God's in charge. He's just another tool, you know, just like all the rest of us. Uh, okay, um, let's read Obadiah. Uh, my text has a heading, Edom will be humbled. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the, from the Lord. And remember, whenever you see Lord capitalized like that, it's Yahweh. We've heard a report from Yahweh. And a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up. Let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread, uh, by the way, which is a, a companion, is the, is the uh, Latin there, for those who eat your bread, uh, that's where we get the word companion, people who eat bread with you, have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, declare the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau uh, will be cut off by, slot, by, by, by slaughter. Edom's violence against Jacob. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, which is Israel, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. 
And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possession. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau, stubble. <coughs> they shall burn them and consume them. And there shall be no survivors for the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. And those of Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shephard shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. All right. Um, I want those of you who have a study Bible, don't need this. Does anybody have a study Bible? No. Okay. This is uh, this is in the study Bible, but it's really good. Luther on Obadiah. Does it comment on all the minor prophets or on all the books? Yeah, yeah. There's a Luther comment on all the each of the books of the Bible. Okay, I just want to read through this. Luther and Obadiah. Obadiah does not specify the time when he lived. However, his prophecy applies to the time of the Babylonian captivity. So you see, Luther went with he later cutting off. Luther went with, with the uh, earth, the later day. Uh, for he comforts the people of Judah that they shall return to Zion. His prophecy is directed especially against Edom or Esau which bore a special and everlasting hatred against the people of Israel and Judah, as usually happens when friends turn against each other, especially when brothers fall into hatred and hostility against each other. Such hostility knows no measure. The, I had a, a history professor one time that said, every division in the Lutheran church had nothing to do with theology. It's always about family. Yeah, I, think, I don't think it matters. Yeah, but yeah, that's what he's talking about. I mean, Jacob and Esau is what he's talking about. Oh, right. You know, it's funny when, I, when we start, first started reading Obadiah, the way it was worded about Esau and everything, I almost thought that it might have been more near the beginning because Esau would have been more fresh in your mind. Right. Hundreds of years later, things like that have a tendency to Well, you know. even, uh, even so, even if you go with the early uh, writing, you're talking, oh, let me think, Esau would have been, it still would have been hundreds of years. Because yeah. even the eight, even if we go with the 800, 860, Esau's what, 12, 12 or 1300, I think? I'd have to look that up. But I think either way, you're hundreds of years away from Esau. Yeah. Uh, so here the Edomites hated the Jewish people beyond all measure and had no greater joy than to see the captivity of the Jews boasting and mocking them in their misery and wretchedness. Almost all the prophets denounced the Edomites because of their hateful wickedness. Even Psalm 137.7 complains of them and says, Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Raise it, raise it, down to its foundations. This hurts beyond measure when men mock and laugh at those who are wretched and troubled, defying them and boasting against them. It constitutes a great and strong assault, Astung is the German there, upon their faith in God and a powerful incentive to despair and unbelief. Therefore, God here appoints a special prophet against such vexations, mocker, such vexatious mockers and tempters, and comforts those who are troubled, strengthening their faith with threats and denunciations against hostile Edomites, those who mock the wretched and with promises and assurances of future help and rescue. In such distress, this is truly a needed comfort and the one who brings it, a veritable Obadiah. At the end, of, uh, he prophesies of Christ's kingdom, that it shall not be a Jerusalem only, but everywhere, for he mixes all the nations together, Ephraim, Benjamin, Gilead, the Philistines, the Canaanites, Zarephath. This cannot be understood to refer to the temporal kingdom of Israel, 
But according to the law of Moses, these tribes and people had to remain separate and distinct in the land. And that's from uh, Luther's American edition, uh, Lectures on Obadiah. But, it, but I got it out of the study Bible. That's where it came from. This is a section. If you have a study, Lutheran study Bible. So we talked about who the Edomites were. Uh, in verses uh, 5 through 10, you see the totality of, of judgment against those who mock and make fun of God's people. Okay? And that's why I said it is such an important and meaningful promise to the Christian church is that we can barely turn on the TV without hearing somebody make some kind of snarky comment about Christianity or the church or faith or things like that. Um, I, I was just watching, have you, have you seen the movie Don't Look Up? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's, it, yeah, well, it's good if you can, if you can stand it. <laughs> um, it's making fun of, really, it's, it's a parody of the coronavirus, and it's making fun of both sides uh, equally well. Uh, you know, they have um, Meryl Streep playing the president, and she's the Donald Trump figure. And uh, then they have, uh, they have this, you know, musicians singing about it, and, you know, newscasters, you know, proclaiming their view of it. And, and this one lone scientist who's played by... Um, uh, Johnny Depp. Uh, we, I've never seen him in a role like this. He did a really good job. Uh, this one lone scientist just keeps trying to say, but but this is but let me tell you, this is what's going to happen. We have a meteor the size of Mount Everest heading for the Earth. This is a a climate changing, life ending catastrophe. You know, we have to do something. But no, we're going to have the the uh, the big phone mogul who has self cellular phones all over the world, he's going to, to break the meteor up and claim it because he wants, he wants to mine it for all of its gold or whatever it is, you know. But he's going to do this out of the goodness of his heart. And Anyway, it's, I haven't watched all of it. I've been watching it on, when I'm on the treadmill, so I've watched half an hour at a time. Uh, but there's this scene in it where this kid talks about God, and one of the scientists looks at him and says, you believe in God? And he's like, well, yeah, don't tell anybody. And that's sad. You know, that's the kind that, and you got to think, that's what our kids are seeing. You know, our teenagers and our kids are seeing that movie. I mean, I hope they're not letting little kids see it because there's a lot of, you know, foulness in it. But, uh, but our teenagers are seeing that movie that where the, the guy is apologetic about being Christian and doesn't want him to, don't want anyone to tell anybody. So when, when, we, when we live in that world, uh, where Christianity is something to be embarrassed about, and and our and not only Christianity is generic Christianity, but our particular understanding of the Scriptures, you know, which, which I agree, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is a little bit rigid. You know, we have a rigid view of what God says, because that's what God says, uh, and so we're not Pollyanna about it and say, okay, let's all hold hands and and believe whatever we want to believe and you're okay and I'm okay you know we, no I'm sorry I love you but when you sin you're offending God I think you should know that okay if you choose to say I don't care I'm offending God I don't want to all right your business but I can't pretend like it's okay for you to offend God you know you, that that's not that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod thank God uh, and thank God that we have uh, Bishop Harrison, uh, who has pulled us back into that path. Uh, for a while, we were drifting. Uh, after after uh, um, Bishop uh, Barry, yeah, Barry, Barry died. Um, after he died, uh, well, Kuhn did a good job. Uh, he filled in for Barry. He was the first vice president when Barry died. Uh, but you know, it, we were drifting off center, bad. I mean, we were drifting into, into American evangelicalism. And uh, thank God he sent us uh, Bishop, President Harrison, Bishop Harrison, because he's pulled us out. It's, a lot of people don't like him. He was on ABC. Was he? I told you that the other day. Did you? You told me that you were in the middle of talking about something this week. Yeah, he was on the Light for Life. He was on Channel 9 News. 
Great. Oh, yeah. Seven. 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 When they showed seven, they didn't show it. Really? Yeah, yeah. they made the and they didn't support it. Did he? Because you are the ones that are, um, which one is it, bro? Like, seeing the end of it? Yeah, Roe versus Wade. Roe versus oh, Wade, yeah. That's I'm great. <laughs> he might be. He yeah. has the chutzpah to do it. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, they didn't say, did they say who he was? I don't remember because it was just they like just, that. No, they just kind of like flashed in when he was talking. And, you know. They had priests on there, but then they had Jesus. Excellent. Oh, ex- I'm sorry, I didn't, I guess I didn't, it didn't register there was, for him. There was a protest going on. There was a, and there were both sides of yeah. the protest. There was. Oh, okay. There was a peaceful protest. Yes. And he was there. Did he have frozen water bottles and he was throwing them at cops? Because that's what a yeah that's what a peaceful that's what a peaceful protest is, right? They said that Illinois they they're doing because it's so yeah. controversial. Mm. So many women are coming here from other states. Yes, they are. Yeah. WGN didn't even cover the other the other protests. They Interesting. only covered the um, Interesting. Protests. Good. Good for them. But I, I saw, but when I saw it, they said, but on the other side of the street, there was some. They did on ABC, but on oh. WGN, they did not mention the other. Well, hmm. I saw it. Um, Great. It, it wasn't ABC, because I don't watch ABC anymore. So the point is, is that we live in this world where, yes, I understand it is difficult. It is difficult to stand and to say, this is what we believe because this is what God says. And it doesn't matter how hard it is for you or how you feel or how you think you were born or, or how, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. This is what's acceptable. This is what isn't acceptable. Okay. This is what God says. There is forgiveness for everybody, but we doesn't, we don't change what God says. Okay. And so this is a incredible to hear this, uh, this statement about being utterly de- devastated. This is an incredible message f- for us as the church. It gives us a great deal of confidence and power. You know, the, the point is, is that, you know, what, what God's saying is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess around. Uh, you, you, when thieves come in and rob from you, they only take what you want. I'm taking everything. This is going to be like the Grinch. You know, you're going to wish to God you had no pe- opposed me. Uh, when, when, Gleaners come, I mean, and take your crops. They still leave a little bit left. They don't pick it. I'm going to take everything, everything. You're going to be completely pillaged. You're going to wish the Assyrians uh, had come and taken you. It's going to be bad. Uh, That's what I said in my sermon Sunday, is it's going to be horrific for people who oppose God. Um, And that does two things. First of all, it gives us comfort in that who our leader is. But it also gives us motivation to try to explain to people what side they need to be on, you know, because there's there's some people who have chosen their side, they've they've made the decision, they're in. But there's a lot of people who are just lost, who are just following the nonsense. Living in the relevant world. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, whatever's relevant for me. And whatever's truthful for me. What is truth? Yeah, that's what Pacha Pilate asked. What is truth? Yeah, right. Yeah, so this is, this is a huge promise for the church. Uh, verses 11 through 14 is a specific indictment against what the Edomites did to God's children. Talking about, uh, in 11 through 14, talking about the violence they did against Jacob. How they um, stood aloof as the strangers carried off his wealth, foreigners entered his gate. Um, This should be motivation also for us uh, not to be like that. Uh, That sometimes sometimes in the history, uh, the church has done that as well. It just stood back and said, hey, not our problem. No, it is our problem. The whole world's our problem. Uh, Until the day Jesus comes back, we're commissioned to proclaim his word to the whole world, whether they want to hear it or not, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's safe or not, you know, to use all the watchwords, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Our job is to proclaim the word of God to everyone who wants to hear it. 
regardless of the situation. So many missionaries, foreign missionaries, you know, have lost their lives for that uh, because they have proclaimed the word of God. Not even foreign missionaries, just Christians in, in some countries where they're not protected. Uh, in uh, where was that just recently where so many Christians were killed? I can't remember. It was an, Af an African nation, but I don't remember which one. Uh, 15 through 21 is a shift uh, to the day of the Lord. That's the end times. Uh, the great reversal is what they call it uh, in the prophets. Uh, it's where everything turns around. That's what we're looking forward to is the great reversal uh, where we're on top uh, and and everything is brought back to the way it was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. Okay, Everything is reversed. Uh, Mount Zion is a metaphor for the church. Okay, So when you see Mount, the, but in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. The house of Jacob, that's us, shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Jacob, a flame. And the house of Esau, stubble. Okay? That's what we hang on to when we're in the midst of persecutions. Not that we have ever had to experience horrendous persecutions in this country. You know, we've been very fortunate. Uh, the persecutions that we have to endure are pretty minor compared to what Christians endure in other countries. But it's what we hold on to whenever we have any persecutions, is, is this, re, this re, remembering this, that there will be no survivors for the House of Esau. It'll be over. Uh, well, everybody had enemies. Uh, they were not united with other, particularly united with other nations that I know of. You'd have to look at the history to see that for sure. But uh, with who they, I, I mean, they clearly had some, uh, they had some uh, treaty of some sort with Philistines. Uh, Philistia is right next door. And Philistia raided Israel, but not them. So there must have been. There, there were. They always had different protection agreements. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got an ally. Well, in Israel, you know, don't survive. that's what Israel got in trouble for. You know, uh, is is uh, making treaties with uh, the the king of Egypt uh, against the Assyrians, and God said, No, 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 no. You depend on me, not Egypt. And, well, yeah, okay, we'll depend on you, God, but we're going to make sure Egypt's in, in our back pocket, too. You know? And, of course, the Assyrians swept down and killed them all. You know? uh, so God didn't put up with that. God says, no, you trust me. And that's hard. You know, that's hard. You know, I'll trust in God and my IRA. You know, that, that's what we like to say. That's what, what we like to think. Well, yeah, I'm going to trust in God, but... I'm also going to have this just in case God doesn't do it. That's why that's anybody who wants to win the lottery, that's why they want to win the lottery. Because they don't want to have to trust in God. Because if I win the lottery, I've got everything taken care of. You know, I don't ever have to trust in God again. That's, that's just the reality. And anyone who says that's not true, think about it. You know, if you want to win the lottery, it's because you don't want to trust in God. Oh, no, I want to do so much good. I want to give it away and do this and that. You don't think God can take care of those things? You think God's incapable of, I don't know, whatever your United Way. I want to make the United Way a great and prosperous charity. You don't think God can do that if he wants it done? You think God can't print money? If Joe Biden can print money, God can. <laughs> you know, God can print all the money he wants. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the bottom line is, is the only reason we want to win the lottery is so that we don't want, so that we can do things that God hasn't provided for us. The reality is, if God wants me to have three hundred sixty million dollars, He'll provide me three hundred sixty million dollars, and I suspect He knows that I can't handle it. You know, the old few good men line. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. You know, that's how you picture God. Yeah. Danya, when she was, when we were lived in Seattle, she worked for an attorney who had a client who had won the lottery and he, the, the attorney was representing this client. He was upside down, meaning he owed more than it was worth, mm -hmm. on five yachts. Oh, dear. Why do you buy five yachts? And they weren't like a, it wasn't like a business. Yeah, <laughs> but he was upside down. 
you'd put payments down. And <laughs> Why would you do that? Okay, um, let's see. I think that covers most of what the last thing I really want us to think about uh, is from the perspective of Esau. Uh, if you look at verse three, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting verse for us. Uh, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. Um, so the, the Edomites lived in uh, cliffs. There are a lot of cliffs in that part. And it's, it's just south. Edom is just south of the Dead Sea. And I've never been there, but, but, if, but I've been told and I've seen pictures that they have lots of cliffs. You've been there. And cliffs, and they apparently they had their they had lots of those caves or whatever they are fortified, so they could I guess throw rocks down on the enemy, you know. And so the Edomites took a lot of pride in the fact that pff, you can't get into our country. We'll you know we'll, we'll bomb you with rocks from our cliffs. Uh, and so I like the, the the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock. And my question is, for all of us to think about. What false rocks uh, we have in our lives? You know, what are our false rocks? Because everybody has them. You know, at one time or another, uh, you have your, 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 you're putting your trust in something that you should not put your trust in. Uh, could be a person, could be a thing, could be anything. Uh, but that's th always think about that from this perspective is that when you put your trust in things, uh, God's speaking to you here. Is it, pay attention. Uh, the pride of your heart has deceived you. That's a great line. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Uh, you who say, who, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? God. <laughs> yeah. You go pick it on the people that are down there, and then all of a sudden you've got to go to the bathroom. Well, how do you get down? <laughs> 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 I somehow don't think that's what the Lord was thinking about. But. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, there was a commercial out. But that's not, not another commercial. It was a, a show. And I remember this guy, he was in the kitchen of his house, and a bird flew and hit the window. Yeah. Uh, and he started laughing at the bird. Ah, he was super great. He's just being haughty as haughty as that. You know, yeah. He turns around and takes a step and runs right into the... In the sliding glass door. <laughs> Yeah. When you start trash talking and you start, you know, having this wishing that other people have misfortune, yeah, yeah, you better really be careful. Right. That's a that's a, a great example of how the pride of your heart has deceived you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, the other part there is verse four. Though though you soar like the eagle, uh, that's an interesting idea. There is because the eagle that they're the bird that they're referring to there, they think was a particular type of buzzard. That that was was used was was very common in that part of the world that lived up in the clefts you know of the rock and uh, and it's just kind of interesting to think of the Edomites as carrion you know which they really were you know as they fed on they fed on the the disasters of the people of God uh, and somehow and, and and that's you know exactly what you're talking about is allowing other people's hurt and other people's hardship to give you pleasure. You know, or to give, or to make you feel better about yourself somehow. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, the pride of your heart is deceiving. That's a great line that I like to think of, of frequently. Um, is that because I think it's a, I think it's something that we can all fall into easily. Uh, so I, when I, whenever I find myself being prideful in something, I try to remind that I love that verse. The pride of your heart is. Don't let the pride of your heart deceive you. Remind yourself, just a tool. I'm just a, if, if I've done good work, it's because uh, I'm a tool in the hand of the master potter. Yeah, but it's, I'm just a tool. No. Just recently here, I was uh, on a text screen with a bunch of guys, you know, and somebody made a comment, you know, oh, you're happy, Merry Christmas to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And then he takes on, except for Van Nagy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's just wrong. Yeah. You know, I had to say something. That was just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know the guy was uh, trying to be, uh, yeah. you know, funny, you know. Right. 
Right. Some things are, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to close for tonight. Uh, next week we take up Joel. So if you want to read ahead and you want to read through Joel, I don't think we're going to be able to read through all the prophets completely every time, but we'll see what we can do. What's that? One day for a book. Wow. Yeah, we'll try. We'll see what happens. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to we're going to go through the whole thing or whether I'm going to, I'm going to pick pieces of it, but we'll decide when we get there. Uh, let's close the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Amen. And Dina and Lucas, come back. <laughs> I don't know. No, they're not on, but no. maybe they'll watch later. <laughs>